you doing? Yo, back in town with Jav talking, baby, it's all around. We do heavy metal news and hot rock too. Come on, baby, wanna jive with you, shit. You doing a little old rap? What's that all about? Hey, man, geez, what you doing? You ain't rhyming. Come on now, I'm gonna give you sliming, sliming on your balls, sliming on your hat. Come on, baby, what you think about that shit? Get to it now, it's Jab talking. Everybody have fun, say ho, 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 hey ho. Come on, baby, baby, come on, baby, 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 let's jab. Shit. I really screwed that up. I have a hard time with the fucking rapping, is the problem. I'm not good at rapping. I've been listening to a lot of 80s breakdance music. There's a great playlist on Spotify. And, and what I'm learning is none of them were good at rhyming and rapping. A lot of it's about microphone. When I get on the mic, it explodes. You know, shit explodes, shit goes crazy, people party, everything. When I get on the mic, I tell you what. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to a fine, fantastic edition of Jive Talking with Shane Diablo, episode 128, I do believe. I do not do any studying at all, ever. But, you know, I'm just saying, I believe it to be 128. We, here's stuff that we're not going to get to. Um, uh, Steve Albini, the guy that did In Utro, he, he mixed and mastered and produced uh, In Utro Nirvana. He passed away, 61 years old. Um, uh, Disincarnate's drummer passed away. Uh, um, the, the singer for the Dicks, punk rock band, he passed away. A lot of that going on. A lot of it. Uh, Blabbermouth is becoming the obituary page. And we've got a pretty grim uh, set of stories here. But uh, some of the stuff that we weren't going to touch is uh, Wolf Hoffman of Accept. He says he owns, I am never going to retire ever, ever again. Um, and, you know, there's so many things going on. Zoltan Cheney uh, from uh, uh, Five Finger Death Punch, he says it was so damn surreal having Megadeth open. But we've got a lot of stories here. We got Charlie Benante, we got Michael Sweet, we got all sorts of stuff get, to get into. I've got some griefs and some 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 grievances that I need to spit out at some point. I have a sip of my drink and we go. Welcome to this episode. You could always tell a friend about it. Um, you could always hit the five star and give me a five star review. It's on Amazon and all those places, I believe. Uh, if you listen to enough podcasts, you hear them all say the same thing. It, that really does something for me. If you give me a five-star review, it really does something for me. So, you know, it's out there. Okay, do with it what you will. Let's get into the first one. No, this isn't some kind of dirty homeless man from, from Los Angeles. This is the lead singer, and he's in his makeup and garb and his, his overalls. Was Did we ever think that the one overall strap and then having the tit nipple hang out shirtless was ever good look i mean even back when it was kind of the hip hoppers were doing it and stuff you know it's just kind of like i don't know i know that farmers don't appreciate that but uh let's get into it because he says uh he's gonna weigh in chad gray from mudvane gonna weigh in on who created heavy metal I did a short about the top five songs that people consider to be heavy metal. Um, you know, like the first ever heavy metal song. So I'll be curious if he happens to mention bands such as Black Sabbath, Steppenwolf, Crims King Crimson, um, Blue Cheer, Summertime Blues. So we'll see. In a new interview with I-95 WRKI radio station Mudvayne and Hell Yeah singer Chad Gray was asked which artists he would credit with the creation of heavy metal. He responded as transcribed by Bibermouth. Man, oh man, you go back. You got to go back to Lemmy, Motorhead. There's one. But that's Hawkwind, maybe? You got to go back to Ozzy Osbert, Black Sabbath. It's so funny because Vinny, Paul Abbott, late Pantera and Hell Yeah drummer told me a story one time. I guess it would have been in the 70s. And they were young. I mean, really young in the 70s. Him and Dime, Vinny Paul's brother and late Pantera guitarist Dimebag Daryl Abbott, were young. 
they were like in high school or something, uh, high school or something. And he said they went to a party at somebody's house. And I think he was like 17, Dime was like 15 or whatever. Uh, they go to a party and some, at somebody's house. And they better have some fucking Van Halen ready to go. Van Halen and the full Van Halen and Hagar catalogs is the greatest party rock of all time. They better have that at this party. They go to a party at somebody's house, man. It was fucking rad. And he's like, dude, we walk in there, man. Everybody's hanging out and people are smoking weed. People are drinking, da, da, da. Were they listening to that Alice Cooper record? He's like, man, somebody put on Black Sabbath, man. He's like, me and my, me and left my, what? He's like, man, somebody put on some Black Sabbath, man. He's like, me and my brother looked at each other. They looked at each other. He's like, that shit was scary. He's like, we left, we left because he said it just sounded like the fucking devil's music. And that was his first exposure to Sab, the Sabbath. I just thought it was so funny. Because when he told me the story, he had the fear in his eyes. He's like, man, dude, me and my brother just looked at each other. And he's like, man, this is fucking scary, bro. Have a couple of drinks of that jungle juice they've got there at the party. Is that what they, is that the, you know, the, the, the fruit juice? I don't know if that's just some kind of t terrible thing that I just said there. Go to the, you know, have a couple drinks of the keg and then listen to Sabbath, bro. You'd be saying, dude, let's freaking start worshiping the devil. What do you think? And his brother said, hell yeah. Man, this is fucking scary. He's like, this is straight up devil music. I guess they got Texas accents though, right? Dime bag was on. Man, this is straight up damn devil music. And I just thought that was so funny. But that's Chad Gray going, I thought it was so funny. But, but you know, Dimebag would say, man, dude, me and my brother just looked at each other. And he's like, man, that is fucking scary to me. Hold me, Dime. Hold me. Circling back to the original question, Chad said, so, I mean, you've got to credit Sabbath, and you've got to obviously credit Lemmy and Ozzy and early, early, early Metallica. Where's this guy born? The all, I mean, Metallica was, was the, the fans of heavy metal. Tiger Japan Tang, shit like that. That's what Lars put on his flyer for looking for people to rock out with. He said Tiger Japan Tang, Saxon. I think it was all British bands that he put on there. Anyways, uh, early Metallica, uh, that was a big part of it. Iron Maiden, obviously. Judas Priest. And we could go on and on. I mean, Rob Halford has said we're the original heavy metal band. He said that's flat out. The list goes on and on and on. Mudvayne will support Megadeth on a North American tour this summer. The 33-city nationwide trek Destroy All Enemies, produced by Live Nation. Includes stops in Los Angeles, Las Vegas, Boston, and St. Louis, and many more. With additional support from all that remains, the tour begins in Rogers, Arkansas on August 2nd and runs throughout the month before wrapping up in Nashville. They love wrapping things in Nashville, don't they? All these damn metal bands, they say, man, we got to wrap it up in Nashville, Tennessee. On September 28th, that's a, that's a pretty good go, right? August 2nd to September 28th. Mudvayne completed its first headlining tour in over 14 years, the Psychotherapy Sessions, last summer. Support on this 26-city trek, which was produced by Hive Nation, came from Cold Chamber along with Guar, Nonpoint, and Butcher Babies. That's an interesting set of bands. Nonpoint being in there next to Guar. They put, you know, they put Nonpoint right on after Gore. And they're like, man, everything's fucking sticky up here. 
Previously, Mudvayne made waves in 2022 when they embarked on the Freaks on Parade tour, co-headlining with yeah, Rob Zombie. This 2023 tour, however, marked Mudvayne's first headlining endeavor since 2009. Staying with this, let's get over here to, uh, this is a heavenly guy. This is Matthew Sweet, the sweet boy. There's Robert Sweet. He's the sweetest boy. You, you know, Mama, Mama Sweet, she says, Robert's the sweet boy, but Michael was a little hooligan. But he's, he ha I didn't know he had thyroid surgery, and he says it's affected his singing. This guy, everything, I think the thyroid is there in the neck area. If I could be right about that or I could be wrong. So anything in this vector, he's had work done on, you know, because his retinas, he's having issues with that and everything else. Stripers, Michael Sweet, on how his recent thyroid surgery affected his singing. And I heard him do, and if you haven't seen it, you can go and watch him do a tribute to C.J. Snare. B -b 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 Baby, don't treat me bad, singer who passed away. And they do... Um, all she wrote. So you can go watch that live. Maybe we'll do that and check in with that. We just had to get to some Motley Crue this week. Jesus. That was their first performance of the song Dogs of War. Uh, let's get in. In a new interview with Steve Mascord of White Line Fever. I got the White Line Fever TV. Isn't that, that uh, coca? If you got the White Line Fever... And Michael, the sweet boy, is going to be on a podcast about cocaine? I don't think so. He's saying, what's, I need to know what the white line fever means first, before I come on your podcast. Striper frontman Michael Sweet, who underwent partial thyroidectomy, the surgery to remove part of his thyroid gland five months ago, reflected on the procedure saying, Honestly... I had a nodule and a nodule in each side of my thyroid. So thyroid nodules, so thyroid nodules. And one of those got larger and larger. It was biopsied and it was cancer. Oh. So they removed half of my thyroid. They left half. The right half, I still have. I have a nodule there still that's cystic. They're going to keep an eye on. I had to start thyroid medication, but I had the surgery back in December through December 15th. So I just finished the vocals. They did it for 15 days. They're in there. Going, He's bleeding everywhere. Took him 15 days. Back in December, December 15th. Oh, he was just trying to recollect the day. December, December 15th. So I just finished the vocals for the new Sunbomb album. Who's he doing that with? I forgot. George Lynch. Prior to that, went in and had my surgery. And then when, when I came out of surgery, I started on the new Striper album. So it was really wild and just an absolute blur. Regarding how the operation affected his singing vocals, Sweet said, I could feel the pressure of the room and the space in that area with those nodules getting larger. I could feel it. And it's been like that for years. Really. I've had them for a while, but I had to have it removed because of the cancer. I dealt with it right away. But having the side of that thyroid removed, they had to cut through some muscle so I can really feel it. It just feels different. It's the only way I can describe it. My vocal nerve was not damaged. I went to the best doctor in Boston who specialized in that, specifically not damaging the vocal nerve. He's very good at that. The guy in Boston, the guy in Chicago, he says, no, we go right for the nerves. But this guy was like, I specifically, I specify myself in not damaging vocal nerves. He uses a very particular monitoring system, computer, and he kind of wrote the book on that. They always do. Whoever's going to the doctor, they say, and I guess the guy was created molecules or something he was involved in something like you know oh i'm getting my surgery done and, and i guess this guy is like the grandson of the guy that created the scalpel so you know i'm in good hands i'll be fine 
Um, oh, he's going to say, thank God in here. So my vocal nurse was not damaged. I went to the best doctor in Boston who specialized in that. He used a very particular monitoring system, and he kind of wrote the book on that. And no damage to my vocal nerve. Thank you, God. But still, it feels weird when I sing. It feels like someone kind of has their hand on my throat. It's the only way I can describe it. Striper recently completed work on the follow-up to the 2022 The Final Battle album for a tentative September 2024 release this past March. Sweet wrote in an online post, oh, he wrote it on a post, that he was a little nervous about the voice prior to the recording session for the new Striper album. But in all sincerity, it seems fine to me, he said. I didn't have any trouble tracking vocals, and if anything, it seemed a little easier this time around. I have to say that this album has a very special signature. It has a heaviness, yet at the same time a very melodic approach and a bit more of a sing-along style. When it comes to the choruses, it's got a sing-along style when it comes to the chorus. I'm really pleased with the results, I truly believe it will be at the top of everyone's best of lists. Everywhere you go, you'll see it in the best of lists. Uh, there are some, some standout tracks to my ears already, but I won't go into details quite yet. Bottom line, a killer new Striper album is coming. So there you have that. We wish him everything in the best. I'd love to know where that is because now all of a sudden I feel like I'm having symptoms. It's just the, you know. Are you familiar with this guy? He's got the, the rock nips going on through his, his wife beater t-shirt there and his suspenders. Great combo, right? It's like the 1950s guy that slaps his family around at home, you know, after he gets home from selling vacuums or whatever. This is Andy Beersack, Beersack, and we did this band just this week. Uh, it's Black Veil Brides, and, uh, uh, and the song we did was Bleeders, reaction video to it. And uh, I just thought this was interesting because he says he got into Metallica through Danzig and Sam Hain, whereas I would have got into or known about like Misfits, Sam Hain, Danzig from where? The 598 EP. Or maybe I knew of Danzig. Yeah, I knew of Danzig before that because he'd come. Um, not to my house or on me or anything, but he'd, I'd, I'd heard of him coming in concert. Anyways, he learned about Metallica through them. So let's find out what he had to say about that. In an interview with Radioactive Mike Z, Hosted on 96.7 KCALFM program, Wired in the Empire. We're live. Wired in the Empire. Black Veil Brides frontman Andy Beersack. And I don't know if I'm saying that right. Beersack. That's a guy that dresses, the guy that dresses that way, he doesn't say Beersack. How you doing? I'm, a, I'm Andy Beersack. He says, Beersackens, please. Um, why didn't they, what did, what did uh, Mr. Radioactive Mike Z say? Andy Beer, Byers, Byersack was asked if uh, he, he's a fan of Metallica. Do you like that Metallica rock? Those rock tunes from Metallica? He says, you know what? It, this is interesting. I'm a Metallica fan through Danzig, Sam Hain, original Danzig bassist, Erie Vaughn, all that stuff. Yeah, I, 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 I've spoken a couple times with Erie Vaughn over the years. Erie Vaughn did a side band called Rosemary's Baby, Coffin. And my band, Die Monster Die, was into all the spookster stuff. So, so Steve Zing and uh, uh, Blasco and all of them, they were doing horror bands at the time as well. It was horror punk, horror metal, horror... Psycho Billy was fitting in there with all that stuff. So, yeah... Uh, Erie, Van, uh, Erie, Erie Vaughn was a dude that was around. So, back, Shane. Back to my Metallica story. Thank you. So, Metallica wearing those Misfits and Sam Hain shirts. It's kind of the reverse how most people found Metallica. Most people found the Misfits and Sam Hain through Metallica. 
Yeah, because the first time I would have seen the Crimson Skull and thought that's the coolest fucking thing I've ever seen is when one Cliff Burton slapped my young tender hands at the lock at the rock concert they opened up for Ozzy. And that's the first that might have been the first time I ever saw the skull and I said, that's a fucking that's that's tits. I was a kid for whatever reason, I just wasn't heavenly exposed to beyond the ex exposed beyond the black album. I didn't know much about Metallica. So then years of, of being such a Misfits, Danzig, Sam Hain fan, I got more and more into it. And one of my best friends, Ryan Downey, does, uh, he does uh, Speak and Destroy. You might have heard of that, which is, uh, Metallica's, um, which is a Metallica podcast. So I'm learning more every week through him about Metallica. I thank him so much for that, too. And I tune into every episode of my friend, Ryan Downey. I love Metallica, and obviously Ride the Lightning is iconic. My guitar player, Jinx, of course, there's going to be a Jinx in that band. Jinx, with two X's, is also, I got to give him a shout out. I got to give Jinx a shout out here. He's like a Metallica historian. When he played with them in 2012, he caught me up to speed on what the snake pit man, I didn't know what a snake pit was. I thought it was that thing you fell in in Pitfall, that old Atari game. But it turned out it was something that had to do with Metallica. He taught me all that. And all the other stuff. So again, I can't claim that I'm, I'm a fan, but he's the guy who knows everything. That's my sweet friend. Back in 2012, Andy spoke about his appreciation for Metallica's music while promoting Obey Your Master an art exhibit which saw pieces from a range of different artists, including Buyer Socks, who had interpreted various songs from Metallica in their own unique way at the time. Ooh. Buyer Sock said that one of his most fond memories of early adolescence was sitting in his living room with his childhood friend watching Metallica VHS tapes. Lemonade? You know, lemonade and uh, some popcorn. They would thrash along, singing every lyric and banging their heads until their necks felt as if they were gonna they were in a car crash. You bang your head so hard it makes you it makes you feel like you've gotten a concussion from a car accident. As I got older and began to write my own songs, the tone of the style of James Hetfield, he's the lead singer for Metallica and guitar player. His lyrics and singing became a huge influence to me. The use of religious and cult metaphors and, and tenacity with which he sang was something I aspired to and to this day continue to inspire to. Bye. I'm inspired by that. Metallica, to me, is the quintessential heavy metal band. Equal parts darkness, intellect, and vitriol. There you have that. We're done with that because we got to get, look at this guy. And he's, and, and in the video that we did, he had a straight razor because I was just about to say, this looks like a dude that'd be having a straight razor in his pocket. He's like, yeah, listen, see, you're going to give me everything that's in your penny purse. That's right. All five cents. You're going to give it all to me. And next week, you're going to bring me that five cents right here on the corner. That's what he looks like. Sorry, my pointer was right there in his Dingle. Yeah, this will blow your socks off. Charlie Benante, he's holding up the double, the double horns. He wrote, he composed a score. Are you a fan of John Wick, Keanu Reeves? He, he, original score for John Wick pinball game. Now, I've heard bleeps and blops and stuff like that in, in pinball machines. You know, and you hear like a little blip of music. But, I mean, you're blowing me away here with this, with a, an original score. As It's like something that John Williams would write for Star Wars. This guy's saying he wrote for a pinball machine. And you guys will want to spank my bare ass when you hear this. I've never seen a John Wick movie. And everyone I've ever talked to says, you got to see them. They are so great. And then everyone says, it all starts with John Wick, okay? And someone kills his puppy. 
and then he goes on a rampage killing everyone for five movies. And then I'm like, spoiler alert, you told me what it's about. I don't need to see it no more. We're going to whip through this because we want to talk. We want to hear from Mickey D about uh, the last tour with Motorhead, and we got your comments and all of that. So let's 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 see what he's got to say here. Charlie Benante of Anthrax and Pantera now. It's not Pantera reunion. It's not Pant. It's Pantera. Uh, has composed the original score for Stern Pinball Inc. And I do know Stern. I, I know that name. Uh, their newest line of pinball games featuring the world's greatest assassin, John Hick. Created in collaboration with Lionsgate. That's the people that put the movie out. Players will experience the thrilling and action-packed billion-dollar grossing John Wick franchise with film-inspired mechanical features and artwork alongside Stern's all-new dynamic AI combat system. John Wick pinball games are available in pro, premium, and limited edition LE models. The John Wick film franchise is produced by Thunder Road, Basile Iwank, and Erica Lee, along with franchise director Chad Stileski through his 8711 Entertainment Production Company. I didn't need to know any of that. In Stern's John Wick pinball game, players step into the role of the world's greatest assassin as he fights to escape his past. As the titular character, players can engage in a high-speed car chase and fast action drifting across the play field. It's just a fucking ball, isn't it? It's just a ball that's going up ramps and stuff. And you try and swack them. I'm try. I'm late. I'm terrible at pinball, but I love. I'll, I'll throw five, six bucks in there. Um, which incorporates models and artwork inspired by iconic locations from the franchise, including the New York Continental Hotel (spoiler alert) and the Red Circle Club, all set against a dramatic edge lit New York City skyline. Does it have those twin towers in it? I mean, what are we talking here? Is this the newer New York skyline or the old time, the old one? You ever watching a movie? Because there's so many movies that open with the skyline of New York, right? And you see those buildings, you just go, oh, God. You know, you're just about to watch the funniest comedy in the whole world. It's like, da -da 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 -da, and the credits pop up, and then all of a sudden there's those towers. You go, fuck. I don't even want to watch this fucking movie now. Players can also open John Wick's weapons crate to reveal a hidden shot target path to retrieve an array of weapons. Players must use the sculpted blood oath marker carefully or risk the consequence. I didn't know any of this shit. I, I would be curious as to reading other pinball storylines from other pinball machines like Adam's Family or whatever. This seems very complex. Where is his music? Players must use the sculpt of blood. Players need to survive other assassins' complete jobs for the legendary faction of the high table, spoiler alert, and eventually take on John Wick's special assignment. Where in the hell is Common San Diego? I just wanted to hear him talk about it. All right, guys, we're done with this. I. She raised the stakes, John Wick, Pinball Stern, all dynamic. Yeah, we read that. Accompanying the dynamic. Inspired by one of the most iconic, thrilling fran franchises of all time. Where is the talk about the dude doing Charlie Bananis? They don't even list his name. You know, somewhere at the bottom they go, oh yeah, and he made some dings and whops and wing, 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 ding, 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 dings. Let's get into this. There he is. The man, the myth, the legend, Mickey D, looks back on Motorhead's final tour. I went to that. I saw four songs. And they said, we got to go. 
He says, that was a tough one. So this is going to be a real downer, okay? Because we got one more thing, and then we're getting into uh, uh, your comments. So, during a new appearance on Ricky Rackman's Cat House, really, Ricky Rackman, he's like, you know what? I'm going to hold on to Cat House. That's a trademark name. I had a club back in the day called Cat House. My God, I'm going to have a podcast called Cat House. I like Ricky Rackman, though. I liked watching him change over the years. You know, he went from, ha, 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 you guys are rocking good, dudes, to all tatted up and flat-topped and hardcore. He said, so tell me about your new fucking album that you got going on, Woody. You know. Former Motorhead drummer Mickey D reflected on the band's final tour, which concluded on December 11th, 2015, just two weeks before the passing of Motorhead frontman Ian Lemmy Kilmister. He said, Yeah, that was a tough one. See, I was trying to make us postpone that. We are struggling a little bit, and I said, Maybe we should just take a break. Um, but the one that did not want to take the break was Lemmy. He said, Absol he said absolutely not. We got to do this too. Was he, and he wanted to be on stage all the time. And that's how he was. But uh, we had some troubles with Lemmy starting to get a little sick, more sicker than before. And he was more tired and stuff. And that was a tough tour. He continued. Here's the thing. If I had to give a hundred and... I can't... I'm not... I, I, he's going to get dark on us, guys. I got to just read this. Because he's going to he's gonna get dark for some reason. Here's the thing. If I had to give 150% out there, and Motorhead guitarist Phil Campbell did as well, now afterwards, I can't even imagine Lemmy must have given 500%. So these guys are saying, look, we were we were powering 150%. Lemmy was given 500%. And I will be fair with you, the first three tunes, I, I didn't, I, I was going, hell yeah, Motorhead. So he kept, he was going for it. Uh, to be to be able to get through these shows. I mean, we played the 11th of December of 2015 as the last show in Berlin, and then Lemmy passed away the 28th, just a few weeks later. And the guy was rocking his ass off. So for me, it's impossible to even think back that you can actually do that. So you can imagine how much effort it took for him to stay on that stage. I came up with all kinds of ideas because he had the he had a back problem too, and he said the bass is so heavy the back is on fire. But that must have been part of his disease. Now thinking about it afterwards, but he had a back problem, so he said he had to stand on one leg at a time, and it was like fire on his back. And I said maybe once maybe you should take a bar stool or maybe. And he goes. No way, Mickey. Are you crazy? I will never sit down at a show. I mean, I guess he's more southern there. He's, he's, from, he's from England. He said, I will never sit down at a show. And again, not compromise, not changing anything. So all the credit to Lem. So all the credit to Lem right there. Once I give him all the credit right there, he really died with his boots on. Mickey added, I think back and the door a little bit sometimes, and it was just unbelievable that we would go on through it with it. Dee previously reflected on Motorhead's final tour in an interview with uh, Finland's Chaos Sign. He said, Lemmy was, was very excited. He loved doing this stuff. And I do remember that we were having a pretty tough time. Okay, this is all the same stuff. Lemmy was so sick, he was tired, and he couldn't not get him off the road. Both me and Phil said, look, let's take a break. Yes. But he said, no, 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 no. We, we got to play. Okay. So me and Phil were talking. And instead of arguing with Lemmy, trying to get him off the road, let's just help him instead. That's it. That's brothers. And then he says, here, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We got our discrepancy. Because Mickey D says here, the man is. So trust me, when Phil put in 150% 
and Lemmy must have put in 300%. Wait a minute. We got some fake news here because right up here he said 500%. Clear as a bell, clear as a day, he said it. Lemmy had 500%. Right there. Lemmy must have given 500%. Now he's down here, he's talking about 300%. Let's do this real quick, guys. Uh, the new intro, you will not see this or hear this if they try to ding this damn video, but I wanted to watch that trailer for right here, right now, Ghost. Uh, depending on how long it is, because I don't, you know. Beyond. The great beyond. The infinite darkness of the universe. I think they're trying to pull up. Off to the never or whatever, Metallica style. Oneself not being able to experience eternity. They're tongue in cheek. They're fun. However, this is not a tale about death. Uh oh. What? But one of life. There's that Los Angeles. Are you on the level? Are you ready to swim in here and now? Now, you didn't hear any of that if they tried to ding this video. This this hour-long video, they go, No, nah, copyright. Copyright. You didn't hear any of that, or maybe you did. I mean, they're doing an off to the Never Never Land. Or whatever, into the Never. Whatever it was that Metallica did, which I watched some of that, and it wasn't all that bad. About the kid and the, you know, destruction and the, the place going crazy. What was it? Zombies? I can't remember. It is time for your comments. The best part of the podcast, at the end of the podcast every week. If you're interested in being part of that, simple. You're listening to this right now. Well, go to the YouTube video. Put your comments there. And then the following episode, listen intently to hear me talk about you. Because you got a huge ego. I'm kidding. Uh, Mike Buchanan coming up, and he does have his full-on uh, freaking Herman Melville here. Uh, let's go for it. Weird thing is, if you go back to episode 126, all of Miss Althea's comments is there. Don't know what happened. Go back and read it. I mean, did you, you guys saw it in the video. I was trying to find the read more or something, and it was not working. I don't know what the hell. That's bizarre. On this week's movie, uh, movies that are bad, but we love them anyways, Runaway. Yes, this is Gene Simmons. Runaway, 1984. Oh, yeah, Tom Selleck and Gene Simmons, a classic of the 80s. The idea of smart robots being sabotaged and harming humans seems ev ever more plausible. As if other time, as if over time, this movie has sort of ascended the other side of an uncanny valley of plausibilities. Like a lot of better sci-fi about the not-too-distant future, it was prophetic and its, uh, its technological implications. Some words, man. But way off the mark in social ones. Here is a future where consumer robots are the norm, but a male co-worker can invite a female co-worker to, her, to his house for dinner during her first week on the job, and the public respect at what? First week on the job, and the public respects and adequately funds the police. There is also muddled commentary on the news media and the police working with psychics, which was just which was, which was, which was, an actual fad in some departments at the time. I see all kinds of datelines. Somebody's going, mm. you know, they're out by the freeway. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I'm getting, I'm getting a very heavy vibe here. This is where we're going to find the body. This is where he chopped the body up, right here. Right here down this, this as the, the overpass here, is where he chopped the body into several bits. They always got a psychic with them. And then they go, yeah, we didn't find a lick of evidence over there. I didn't say here. I meant 10 feet over there. It's a whole radius. I, get, I pick up signals from miles away. Um, 
As for the production aspects for, uh, of the movie, the action scenes are well done, being just some uh, well uh, well done, being just long enough to be tense, but not becoming tedious. It doesn't really hold a candle to the contemporaneous Terminator film, and has some similar scenes, which is likely why this movie flopped. It might have been a big hit if it had come out a year earlier. Gene Simmons is Gene Simmons. He oozes creepiness, but his performance is totally campy at the same time. Yes. It might have worked if the villain was better developed. We literally learn all we're supposed to know about him when the police chief reads off his rap sheet. And the psychic says there may be a sibling rivalry going on between Simmons and Tom Selleck. Wow, that's an angle I didn't catch before. This movie could have lived up to its, uh, its potential if Michael Crichton took more care in developing the villain. I'm telling you, you're getting it. You're, 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 you know, how crazy would it be if like this, this portion of, of my podcast spikes and it's the best part? People say, I only tune in for Mike's. Uh, movies that are bad, but we love them anyways. The description read off, and then I'm out. I leave. Grab your favorite beverage. Sit in your favorite chair. Pop some popcorn and press play. Mike Buchanan on Eloy Casagrande on joining Slipknot. Happy for him, but not interested at all. And since you didn't read it from the last, from the last last episode. I'll add something I wrote here. Sorry to miss Althea on not saying anything about Slipknot. And I'm letting her know now that I will not be attending the revival of Knotfest coming September 21st. I don't know what any of that means. He will not be attending. Uh, Mike Buchanan on Phil Demel. Not having ever met Kerry King, I'm sure he's a nice guy, but in the metal world, having a nice guy reputation doesn't get your band anywhere. So put on the act and move on. Kerry King better laugh at my stupid jokes. Well, you know, I'm sure he does. If, if he tunes in for your, for the, your you know, jokes, he probably has a little belly giggle. It's silent, you know those. Got it. <laughs> Fucking Mike Buchanan. You say, what are you doing over there, Carrie? Oh, and fucking Mike Buchanan. There's funny fucking jokes that he tells at the end of this lousy podcast. I, I don't listen to the podcast. I just get the, the movie review that he does and the, and the jokes. And I do belly giggles. That's what Carrie King says about you. Um, on Glenn. Glenn Hughes, first off, the first four albums are just legendary. Legion is by far my favorite album. And yes, the new album slays. Still being nice about Dogs of War, Mom said if you can't say any something nice, what? And yes, the new album slays. Still being nice about Dogs of War, Mom said if you can't say something nice, find something nice to say. So Shane, you are my favorite YouTuber. Hey, hey fuck. I was I was kind of shocked by that. That comment came in just like a sub, you know, it's just under the wire. When you're not prepared for a compliment, you know, it 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 takes you it takes you back a bit. Let's read that again. So Shane, you are my favorite YouTuber, okay? And if you if asked if there ever was anyone on YouTube you would like to meet in real life, my answer would be you. Wow. Thank you, Michael. That's That might be the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. Um, I'm, I'm his favorite YouTuber. I love that. Uh, Mike Buchanan on Dave. Like I've said before, Megadeth is now a solo act for Dave. With his ever-revolving guest musicians, Timu better soak up the experience since he won't be around forever. It's weird. I was thinking about this the other day that, you know, for some weird reason, I used to think, what the fuck is up with the Red Hot Chili Peppers? They're always kicking fucking people out and shit all the time. But you think about it, and that's not really true. It was the th three of them together, and then the guitar players kind of revolved there for a minute. And he's and Dave Mustaine's kicked out more people than he has, than they have. 
Sometimes I feel like I don't have a partner. Um, Mike Buchanan says, yeah, I'll, I'm okay with not ever seeing the ghost movie. Spoiler alert, you just got the uh, intro. Sorry, there will not be a movies that are bad, but we love them anyways about it. Not, you know, I mean, it's, they're, 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 they're uh, Broadway rock, Broadway metal now. And uh, I, I love it. I do. I'll, I'll, be, I'll admit it. Because I'm not ashamed to admit things that I, you know, that I like. But I understand totally that, you know, the first record, there was a lot of metalheads that were like, oh, yeah, dude. But they have, I know what Tobias is doing. He is, and I bet you he would tell you the same thing. He grew up with Metallica, and he saw the twists and turns that they did and the moves that they made, and that's what he is doing now. And he's succeeding. Now they went from clubs and theaters to arenas, and it's got to have the visual package and all of that. He's a smart businessman. He knows what he's doing. And he's getting the, the writers in there, too, now. Because we talked about that with the, you know, he's working with the... Lady Gaga writers and stuff. So, anyways. Oh, boy. What did I do? Oh, I just shut him. Um, and now, your jive talking jokes of the week. And look, Bo. Look. Your jokes aren't there. Are you doing that on a goof? Mike? Hello? Hello? There's no... Do you see here? Show less. That's why I clicked that and it closed it because your jokes aren't there. I apologize for that. There's your heart. No jokes. Um, MB coming in. Carrie King is not a douche. He's a sharing, caring, empathetic Satanist with a tattooed skull. Amen. There you go. Miss Althea coming in. Finally, there it is. It's all there. The dumbstruck fool says, Was it something I said, boo hiss, on my episode 126 comments being randomly cut off with no read more option in your view mode? Trust me, there was more. I know there was. I saw the dots. And there's a resounding ugh amongst your viewers, listeners. And I had a full plate of things to say about episode 125. So I guess if any of your viewers, listeners... Okay, yeah, go back to that other episode because the it's there. Besides Mike B, who replied to one of my points, care, they can go back to, to, to 126 and read it all themselves. Insert approximately 100 devil emojis here. Okay. Yeah, so it's there. Go read those comments. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that was all about. Uh, Miss Althea on Eloy Casagrande. No habla, but doesn't his last name translate to big house? Yes. And he's in the big house now, baby. He's in the big house now. He says, I'm in the big house now. I'm in the big times. I went, I got the big boy pants on. Sorry. Um, and all I see with, with his first name is Elroy, as in Jetsons. The story was inconsequential to me otherwise. Um, I immediately got distracted at the mention of Slipknot's Legion of Maggots because the Gazette has a song called Maggots that is a total banger. Really? Then I got it stuck in my head. Then I had to pause watching so I could listen to it post-haste. Then I got reclamped about the loss of Raida. May, yeah, may he rest in peace. Yes. Uh, Miss Althea on Phil Demel. I, too, would be more interested in hearing about what makes Kerry King laugh out loud or makes him act silly rather than statements about him being a straight shooter giving people the impression that he's a jerk. At the same time, though, I totally understood where he was coming from. A friend of mine falls into the straight shooter category, and she is constantly being called a bitch because of it. 
Man, she's a bitch. Come on, man. Yeah. Uh, yet, the truth is that she is one of the kindest and most giving people around. Just because a person doesn't take any shit doesn't mean they are a piece of shit. And yes, I did say Henson Recording Studio was formerly A&M, and I am saying it again. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's where they did. We are the world... What has not changed over the years, however, is the establishment directly across the street, Crazy Girls Strip Club. Well, oh, she got something by Hide. He went to the Crazy Girls. That boy, that's a, that's a name that Japanese would go for, right? Crazy Girls. Girls Crazy. They see, we got to go there. Hide would frequent it when he was recording, and he was, yes, he was across the street at the A&M. He was recording at A&M in the 90s, but primarily exclusively for their bar, although he did, he did recruit a couple of dancers as models, I use both terms loosely, for a photo shoot with Japan's Ultra Vite magazine, volume 10, August 1990. Jesus, you know all this, don't you? She's down the, the rabbit hole. Volume 10, August 1996 issue, to be specific. We got some stuff coming up from Miss Althea, some video stuff. Videos, reactions. Coming up. He Day. Spread Beaver. Doubt. 98. Was it? No. Yes. Rest in peace. Yes. May 2nd, He Day passes away, 1998. Am I doing good, Miss Althea? And we have a tribute. It's late. Better late than never, though, right? Uh, Miss Althea on Nikki Six. Of course he is going to say it feels like a family on stage. What, uh, what with that big bromance he has with John Five. Like, this is news, and you know what they say. A family that presses play together stays together. Just a little backing track humor. Well, I mean, I didn't talk about it too much, but in my little Motley Crue video, but there's all sorts of stuff popping up where he's lip syncing. I think I figured Vince Neil out. I really do think I figured him out. He's just in it for the money. Because if when you watch him, even in the video that, that, that I did this week, if you watch him, he's not, it is, it is, inconsequential. It means, makes no difference that there's people screaming in front of him or anything. He looks like it's another day at the office when he gets up there and he's off time and everything. And I think he only just is like, whatever. I just want to get up there and do it and get the paychecks. That's what it, it looks like. Miss Althea on uh, Dave Mustaine. Your reading of him calling Timu a mad scientist in your Dave Mustaine voice that I have definitely defined previously as a mad scientist like was classic. Thank you. Um, Miss Althea on Ghost. The only thing I can say about the upcoming film is Papa, you in danger, girl. Yeah. The Papas always die. If you know anything about the, the lore of Ghost, they had Papa 1, Papa 2, Papa 3, Cardinal Copia, Papa Four, and he'll die. There you go, Miss Althea. Well done, well done, well done. Read more. Sticky doll coming in. We love right. We live right near Pappy and Harriet's. Did you go where Slipknot just played? We saw L Seven there a while back. I saw L Seven back in the day. Come out and visit us, and we'll put you up. Just wash your hat first. Oh, can't do it. I was thinking about taking it down to the sink and giving it a good scrub, you know, but I'll have to. Yeah. And you guys would be very surprised that I'm not a smelly person. I mean, I, I smell after work because I bust my ass for low pay and, you know, all of that. But you'd be pretty impressed. You're like, you know, he doesn't, he's not, he, he looks like a stinky person, but he's not really. Um, we can all go down to Party City in Palm Springs. 
and maybe see Carrie King buying one of his enormous fake plastic chains for his stage trousers. I love the word trousers, especially for Carrie King. That is the perfect sentence. Carrie King buying one of his enormous fake plastic chains for his stage trousers. Wonderful. There you go. And Jolly Jake Lavelle coming in say, I'll just say this about the crew's dogs of war. See Vince sing, hear John play, is it music? Question mark. Mm, mm, mm. There you have it. Get out there, seize the day, seize the life, seize the weekend, seize it all. Don't, uh, don't seize up, don't let the engine on the car seize up, but but uh, get out there, do what you need to do to figure out what you need to do next. Um, we're just, I, I kind of, I just want to head out with a song. I'm very lazy this week. And, uh, and it's always that, every damn, every damn time. 